they say there's strength in numbers. It's a lesson taken seriously in the animal kingdom. But what happens when animals gather in numbers beyond our imagination? What happens when a swarm turns deadly and rages out of control? Tonight, prepare to squirm. You're headed for a close encounter with the world's deadliest swarms. The fire ants were simply crawling all over me. started to flow down my back, almost like a hot liquid was flowing down my back. Oh. It looked like he was growing bees out of his head. I couldn't leave the man to die on my front porch. This is what happens when wildlife goes wild. These are the world's deadliest swarms. In the heart of South America, on jungle riverbanks, vast flocks of egrets make their nests. The birds are safe up here in the trees, but down below, a deadly menace is on the prowl. These waters are home to the red piranha, one of the most fearsome predators on Earth. Each piranha is less than a foot long, but its jaws are lined with razor-sharp teeth, strong enough to scratch steel. They may be vicious, but piranha don't bother to hunt. They simply lie in wait and let gravity bring them their prey. With their parents off searching for food, the nestlings are left alone for hours every day. They can barely walk, let alone fly, and one false step can lead to disaster. Unfortunately, this is part of the natural food chain. Piranha are scavengers and consume anything that comes their way. Dogs, livestock, and legend has it, even humans. Up in the tree, the other nestlings watch and hold on for dear life. They seem to know that their survival hangs in the balance. Remember, even the horrifying piranha have their natural enemies. It's all part of the checks and balances of Mother Nature. Since ancient days, locusts have plagued mankind and even today they create disasters of vast proportions. These are the deadliest swarms of all, for locusts can ravage entire countries, destroying the lives and livelihoods of millions. Generally, you'll see a locust swarm from a distance, and it looks like a cloud of smoke lying low over the horizon. As it gets closer, the swarm actually rolls as it's moving along. Locusts near the front of the swarm will land and locusts at the rear of the swarm will be jumping up and joining the ones in the air. So as many locusts as you see in the air, there will be an equal number probably in the grass underneath that swarm. A swarm can contain as many as 40 billion individuals and it can stretch for up to 20 miles. But it's not just the numbers of locusts that creates the problem, it's the size of their appetites. Their powerful jaws cut through vegetation at an incredible rate. In one day, a single swarm can consume 100,000 tons of food. 
enough to feed a million people for nearly a year. A swarm of 30 million locusts can move by you in about 10 minutes. And the sound is kind of a hissing sound. You hear a shh sound. If you close your eyes, you'll be able to hear that. These swarms can move across entire continents, traveling with the wind and behaving more like weather than wildlife. In 1988, one swarm actually rode a hurricane across the Atlantic from Africa to the Caribbean. But wherever they come to land, locusts can sweep across the landscape and strip the countryside bare. But what if locusts struck not farmland, but a major city? When an insect swarm hit Houston, the result was chaos. What happens when you get a locust swarm going over a major metropolitan area, you get lots of people freaking out. You'd have lots of phones ringing in the police office, the politician's office. You'd have people skidding on them in the streets in their cars because the layer on the road would be so thick that you would be sliding around if you were driving over them. If a swarm of locusts descended on Central Park in New York City, they would roost and that night feed. The next morning you would get up and there would be no leaves left on the trees, no grass left, and people would probably be running around screaming. A locust invasion in Central Park is unlikely, but the destruction they cause in other parts of the world is all too real. Wherever locusts swarm, the results are deadly. Cockroaches. 49 million Americans share their homes with these disgusting creatures. And if you see one, you're probably surrounded by thousands of them. But there's more bad news. Cockroaches carry infectious diseases, everything from cholera and tuberculosis to leprosy. And some experts believe they're the number one cause of asthma in the United States. They call Dr. Austin Frischman, Dr. Cockroach. He's an exterminator extraordinaire. If you get a major infestation, he's the man to call. And you better call him fast, because a cockroach has a big appetite. The cockroaches under stress get food. People tend to have food in the bed with them or on their face, and they'll crawl on them and sometimes chew off their eyebrows. A swarm of hungry cockroaches can multiply at a terrifying rate. A single female German roach can produce a staggering 90 million descendants in just one year. And German roaches are only one of the 55 different species of cockroaches found in the United States. People will have one cockroach in their house or two and they're wondering, you know, they want to say, they're hoping it's a stray. Like it's lost and doesn't know where it's coming from. It's not a stray, okay? You physically carry them in, in a cardboard box, in a paper bag. Cockroach climbs on you, a small roach. It's not heavy. You don't go, oh, wow, it's that heavy. It just sort of sneaks in your pocket, and then you bring it home with you. So anybody can get them at any time. They can build up in tremendous numbers before somebody realizes what's going on. No one knows better than Mary Esposito just how bad the situation can get. In April 1997, Mary saw an ad in her local paper and entered a bizarre contest to find the American home with the most roaches. I know they would never eat in my house again if they ever saw how bad the roaches are. And she won. First prize, a free house call by Dr. Cockroach. I went towards the evening myself to Mary Esposito's house to, to review the whole thing before I figured out what I had to do. Go in the little boy's room, and I'm standing there, and, and it's a few antennae, look at me here and here, and, and the little boy says to me, I want to see roaches, mister. Goes over to the drawer, pulls any drawer, it didn't matter, on his desk, bubble, just go bubble. But I would say there was between 70,000 and 100,000 cockroaches in that house, and I may be underestimating, because we were picking things up and putting it in plastic bags, and it was bubbling with roaches. Dr. Cockroach and his crew launched an all-out assault. The battle would last three full days, but now Mary Esposito's house is roach-free. often get frustrated with cockroaches. I said, why are they so hard to kill? It's like, 
I stepped on it, and when I stood up, it ran away. That's a common thing people tell me. Now, they have a hard shell like a lobster has, but they're, they're flattened naturally. So sometimes when you step on that's what's happening. They're flattening and they're getting under your shoe. But they can take off unbelievably fast. They talk about a cheetah, you know. Hey, man, this, this roach is faster on a very short distance. Most people hate cockroaches, and they should. They hate them because they're invading their personal privacy. So, I mean, it, would you like somebody living in your shoes? Snakes. Most of us recoil in fear when we see just one. So imagine stumbling onto a swarm of 20,000 of them. That can happen in Manitoba, Canada during the snake's mating season. And expert Robert Mason can tell you what it's like. So at first it is, it's quite unnerving, it's unsettling to have, to have these animals just kind of walk up on you. But you have to imagine that they just, they really aren't that much interested in you. Because they're really very intent on this mating. It's like many other species on Earth where they have a one-track mind. And when the, the breeding season is going on, they want to breed. And they really couldn't care less about what else is going on. Eager to mate after a winter in hibernation, the garter snakes begin to emerge. First hundreds of males swarm out waiting at the edge of the den for a few females to join the party. Now she will only choose one and only one of those hundred male suitors to mate with. And they're literally swarmed around by these males. And, and they, they ball up. They actually will tumble around on the ground. I'm sure this is some people's worst nightmare to all of a sudden walk into a, a pit of snakes. That could be really a, a petrifying experience to someone that really didn't like snakes. The snakes may be harmless, but for most of us, this swarm is indeed a nightmare. Deep in the forests of a tropical paradise called Christmas Island, there's an army on the move. First, advance scouts emerge from the jungle. Then, the main force sweeps through. More than a hundred million red crabs, determined to reach their ancient breeding grounds on the shores of the Indian Ocean. These aren't killer crabs. They're actually more of a nuisance than a threat. In fact, the crabs themselves face the greatest risk. They've traveled this route for thousands of years. But now there are man-made obstacles in their path, so a million crabs die every year. Still, during the month of their annual invasion, the crabs can bring life on Christmas Island to a dead halt. Their sharp claws can puncture a truck tire, a dying crab's final revenge. For some of the locals, the crab invasion can be a headache. But most of the islanders have learned to cope with the crabs. And for the time being, they'll just have to let the crabs play through. In spite of their losses, millions of crabs do make it to the spawning grounds on the coast. Here they'll lay their eggs and lay the groundwork for a new invasion. In about a month, the baby crabs crawl out of the sea, struggling through the surf and scrambling over the rocks. Within days, they're spread across the beach like a red carpet. Now it's their turn to run the deadly gauntlet their parents had to face. Perhaps the survivors will be a little better prepared when they return in a year or two. The next invasion of Christmas crabs.
Forty years ago, a scientist brought African honeybees to Brazil, hoping to breed a more productive hybrid. When the bees escaped his lab, they spread quickly. Africanized bees will attack anything they perceive as a threat. A toy dog reveals how they retaliate when they're disturbed. Imagine what they would do to a human. Aggressive and belligerent, they've been dubbed killer bees. April 8, 1997, was a hot spring day in Casa Grande, Arizona. Seventy-one year old Frank Garcia and his two sons were cleaning up a rental property, preparing it for new tenants. Hey, take care of my truck. As his sons headed off to the dump, Frank sought the cool shade of a quiet porch. He thought he was alone, but he wasn't. He barely noticed the bees at first, and certainly didn't see them as a serious threat. But when he instinctively swatted at one, Frank may have sealed his own fate. These were no ordinary honeybees. They were killers. When a dying bee sends a signal to the hive, it provokes the entire colony to attack. Overwhelmed by thousands of the stinging insects, Frank struggled to the house next door, desperately seeking help. The Elam family heard his cries, but they weren't prepared for what they saw. We heard a knock at the door, and my wife Mary answered the door, and she screamed. Help me, somebody! Help me! Help me! Please! And so I got up, went over to see what was wrong, and he was just completely covered, his head and his open neck area was just completely covered with bees. In fact, it looked like he was growing bees out of his head. My first reaction was, what What can we do for this man? Uh, he needs help, but if we bring him in the house, then are we just going to be bringing all those bees in here and getting all of us done too? I had to do something. I couldn't leave the man there to die on my front porch. I'm going to grab my veil. So I put on a wedding veil and went outside to try to do something to help Mr. Garcia further. I grabbed the water hose and began spraying the air around him, hoping that that would get the swarm to disperse or leave him alone somehow. And that still didn't seem to be working. The bees were still swarming all over him. My mom, meanwhile, had taken over the phone and she was speaking to the 911 operator. When we received the call, we were thinking that it was just a single bee sting. We had no idea that it was as serious as it was. When we first pulled up on scene, for a split second it ran through in my mind, should we get out? Should we put ourselves in danger? But then a sense of duty came over and I just jumped out and my adrenaline took over. I approached the patient. He was completely covered with these bees. It looked like a carpet of bees just completely covering him. I looked around and nobody was helping me. Nobody was coming around. I turned back, I looked at my partner. And I said, somebody gonna help me! Okay, ready? I'm ready, man. Ready? One, One two, two, three, three go. These were the most aggressive bees I have ever seen. They were dive bombing me. They were striking me like rocks. They were hitting me on the top of the head, on the back, on the neck. There were hundreds of bees still on him. <laughs> I tried to get my partner to help breathe for him while I was checking for a pulse. At that point, I opened up his mouth, and when I looked in, I saw the most horrible thing I've ever seen in my life. His mouth was completely full of bees. He had probably a hundred bees or more in his mouth. So I began scooping bees out of his mouth, and I was just pulling them out by the 20s, 30s. I mean, it was just incredible. Uh, he had bees coming out of his nose. He had bees coming out of his ears and it was uh, pretty creepy. 
When we arrived at the hospital, Dr. Schufelt said that he had over 500 bee stings on him, along with um, bees in his stomach. On the way to the hospital, we tried everything to revive him, but our efforts uh, were unsuccessful. Larry Smith is an expert on Africanized bees. In some areas, the Africanized bees are to so-called biblical proportion. The Africanized bee is here to stay. There's nothing we're going to be able to do to get rid of it, and it is not going to calm down. Whatever we do, we're going to have to learn to live with them. They're not going to learn to live with us. They're going to take care of themselves, and they're not going to go away. When killer bees perceive a threat, they'll attack relentlessly, and they can chase their victim at speeds of up to 11 miles per hour. You can't run 11 miles an hour, and if you jump in a pool, these babies will be sitting there waiting for you to come up out of the water. And the first place they're going to attack is your head. That's the first thing you're going to come up with, air. So don't jump in no swimming pools, lakes, creeks, or rivers. When the Afghanized bee or the killer bee attacks, when this swarm or hive protects itself, it truly is a deadly swarm. Frank Garcia was not the first to fall victim to killer bees. In recent decades, as they spread north through Latin America and Mexico, killer bees destroyed native beehives, devastated agriculture, and killed more than a thousand people. Now they're here in the U.S., and experts have found no way to stop them. Their reign of terror has only begun. Bats usually evoke eerie legends of blood-sucking phantoms, but these Mexican free tails are no vampires. They only eat insects. There may be millions of bats in this Texas colony. Their bodies and breath can heat the cave to 100 degrees, and their waste turns the air into a poisonous soup of ammonia. The bats produce so much waste that the floor of the cave is wall-to-wall -wall guano. But if you look closer, you'll see something moving down there. The ground is a heaving, writhing mass. There's another swarm in this cave. And if there are millions of bats, there are billions of dermistid beetles. These carnivorous insects spend their lives digging through the carpet of guano, feasting on bat droppings. The cave walls are lined with female bats who have come here to breed and raise their young. Until they're able to fly, the babies are completely helpless. Their lives depend on being able to cling to their mother's fur, and they hang on for dear life. But from time to time, a young bat loses its grip, plummeting to the cave floor. For the dermistid beetles, it's time for a feast. These beetles are voracious, and they'll make short work of the bat. Of course, the loss of a few individuals doesn't matter much to the colony of millions. The bats will continue to thrive, and each evening they'll roam the Texas hill country in search of their own prey, swarms of mosquitoes. What they lack in size, they more than make up in sheer numbers. And many of them are carnivorous, feasting on flesh. Swarms of ants can devour much larger creatures, in this case, a jungle frog. And many of them are notorious for attacking in swarms, stinging in unison and hitting their victims with a massive dose of poison. The world's most aggressive variety is the fire ant, and they've invaded much of the U.S. When they attack humans, their bites can cause excruciating pain and even death. Knowing what just a few fire ants can do, imagine being trapped on top of an entire colony and bitten by tens of thousands of them. Jim Blackburn is a psychologist who lives in Texarkana, Arkansas. Well, most of us keep up with the hunting seasons, and the first day is always very important. On October 1st, 1986, Jim headed for his favorite hunting spot, where a deer stand had been set up in the pines. Well, I climbed up with my bow, 
but when I uh, stood on the platform, it had too much give, too much uh, slack. When I attempted to recinch it, I lost the whole thing, and I crashed to the ground from that 16 to 20 foot uh, height that I was at. The fall broke Jim's back. He couldn't move. And the next thing I remember was being on the ground, waking up apparently from shock, lying prone on the uh, ground, uh, as it turned out, across a fire ant hill. Oh. My understanding about fire ants is they're uh, certainly one of the most aggressive varieties of ants that we have. They're fighters, they easily apparently feel a threat. They will sting you in a heartbeat. I knew that I needed to get back to my car if possible. I couldn't stand. Something was wrong with my leg and hip area. Uh, in a lot of pain. So I decided to try to drag myself with my arms. Uh, I did so on two different times and passed out from the pain both times. As Jim slipped in and out of consciousness, the fire ants continued their feast. The fire ants were simply crawling all over my hands, uh, up and down the side of my face, uh, just oodles of them crawling and stinging as they went uh, just about anywhere they could get to me. There was at least two distinct uh, times I tried to crawl, uh, passing out, waking up, sweating, more and more fire ants, uh, and that continued probably for at least uh, four, five, six hours. I was hopeful that at least sometime during the daylight hours, someone else would hear my uh, shouts or call. Help! Help! They did not. Uh, later that afternoon, of course, it started getting dark, and uh, I just resigned myself to, well, I'm going to spend uh, at least the night here. Help! When Jim didn't return that evening, his worried wife called Deputy Ricky Jones. Deputy Jones contacted Jim's old hunting partner, who knew where he liked to hunt. At 9.30 p.m., the deputy and a game warden found Jim's station wagon. That was said it, After we located his car, we began to try to find him. It looks like he's been around. Hey, Jim! I suddenly started hearing others calling for someone. Jim! Jim! I had lost my voice. It was almost down to a whisper. Somebody help! Hey, Jim! Help! Jim, where are you? When we first found him, he was laying on the ground, and of course it was very dark out there. Hey, over here, Jim! Jim! What happened? Stop. It looks like them fire ants got you. Yeah. They had bitten him all over his body. He was bitten severely. We could tell that he was in quite a lot of pain. He's hurt pretty bad. Why don't you get on back to the truck, get on that radio, get the ambulance out here right away. Got it. Hey, hey, bring that back forth back with you, okay? Jim was rushed to the hospital. There, doctors found he'd been bitten hundreds of times. When I got to the emergency room, sure enough, it was obvious that he'd been bitten a number of times his arms were swollen red his neck was swollen and red and any area that was not covered by clothing was red by far the worst case of ant bites i've ever seen uh, before then or up until now fire ants have become a major problem in the united states they were first brought to this country more than 60 years ago carried in with cargo from south america they multiplied quickly. One queen can produce half a million offspring a year. The main problem with fire ants is it's large numbers and it's real aggressive behavior. They not only bite, they sting, they can even spray poison if they feel threatened. Their deadly swarm behavior is just natural for the fire ant and something we're basically just gonna have to learn to live with. When a fire ant attacks a larger animal or a human, they're usually for an aggressive reason. They're going to try to bite you, and they're trying to kill you. Even though I had uh, a leg that was broken in seven places, and 
a broken hip also. By far the greatest pain was that coming from the fire ants. Sharks, they're found in all the world's oceans and the waters off Hawaii are no exception. Most swimmers and divers view them as the ultimate threat. But sharks aren't the only thing they should be scared of. There's something else out there that's even deadlier. Joe Shepper is an ultra long distance swimmer who lives in Hawaii. In September 1996, Joe decided to do something no one had done before, swim from Maui to Lanai and back. My biggest fear in preparing for this was to see a shark and to have it come up and attack me because the Friday morning, the day before my swim, a surfer had been bitten by a shark on Maui and that was pretty frightening. It kind of shook me up a little bit and got me very nervous. I wanted then at that point to get my swim started and to get it over with. For backup, Joe had a six-member support team. Once I got into the water, I felt great. While I was swimming along, it was going pretty quiet, just a lot of blue ocean and beams of light, which was spectacular. I felt great, I felt really smooth, and then you could just feel energy in the water, and all of a sudden, a huge school of fish, thousands of fish, just swam right under me. I was very nervous at that point about always racing through my mind was shark. There's got to be a shark around here. There has to be something coming up to make the school of fish go zooming by like that. Joe was now three miles off the coast of Maui. His support team trailed him by boat in case he needed help. And then all of a sudden, it's like, dang. I was stung on the arm, on the shoulder, and I felt this like really intense pain. And it was like, okay, I got to keep going, that's fine, it's just painful, keep stroking. But then all of a sudden, the pain started to flow down my back, almost like a hot liquid was flowing all the way down to my lower back. And all I could think at that time or feel was my heart pounding in my chest. I could feel it going against my my rib cage, and that's all I could hear. I couldn't hear anything else. I couldn't hear my paddlers. I couldn't hear any of my support crew. I'm thinking, here I am. I, I've swum a million yards in preparation for this, and all of a sudden, I can't lift my arms out of the water. Joe had been stung by a swarm of the world's most venomous creatures, the box jellyfish. Death definitely entered my mind. There was a point I can say that I was probably almost hoping I'd die because of the pain. It looked like he was struggling to stay up above, you know, water at that point, and suddenly he just lunged on top of the board, and that's when we all knew it was over. But we didn't know what had happened until he started then to scream. When we got him onto the boat, and I saw him going into that fetal position, I thought, this is it, because I had heard that box jellyfish are so dangerous you can die from them very quickly. You can have respiratory failure within you know, 30 seconds. Go, go, go. I can't breathe. <laughs> Seeing his severe reaction to the stings, Joe's support team knew they had to act fast. Cass Flag, a registered nurse, recalls. When we got Joe up onto the boat, he was shaking uncontrollably and screaming out in pain. Oh, oh. I knew that Joe was having a severe anaphylactic reaction. There was the possibility that he would stop breathing. I knew that I did not have what I needed to help him. Their only hope was to get Joe to shore. There, doctors would finally stabilize his condition and save his life. We were dealing with the possibility that he would go into full respiratory failure and and he could have died and would have died at that point. Joe was lucky he wasn't swimming off the north coast of Australia. The variety of box jellyfish found there has an even more powerful poison. Contact with its tentacles can bring agonizing death in just four minutes. In Australia, over the past 25 years, 60 people have died, while I believe 14 people have died from shark attacks. So the box jelly in Australia is actually more deadly than the sharks are, even though we hear about the sharks more. These wounds are from an unlucky victim in Queensland, where one mature jellyfish carries enough venom to kill 60 people. Many types of jellyfish swarm, 
in order to mate, not to kill. But swarming greatly increases the odds that a swimmer will come in contact with the drifting tentacles. And it's the tentacles that carry the jellyfish venom. When a tentacle sticks onto you, and when it sticks, that means that the cells have released their little harpoons. It's sticking because it's connected to you and you're having some poison released into your body. I think definitely one of the, the hard and frightening things about the box jellyfish is that they don't make any noise, you can't see them, you barely feel them when you first touch them. And so they're pretty much impossible to avoid if you're in the water. And in that sense, it is a potentially deadly swarm to us. Lifeguards in Hawaii are concerned that box jellyfish swarms are on the increase. Attention beachgoers, we have a jellyfish alert, there are jellyfish in the water. We recommend that you do not go in the water today. On just one day in July of 1997, 800 swimmers on Waikiki reported being stung. Fortunately, there were no fatalities. The oceans are filled with swarms of jellyfish. They're beautiful, and most are perfectly harmless. But the people of Hawaii may soon learn how deadly box jellyfish can be. I think with the quantity that we're seeing them now in Hawaii, that it's just a matter of time before someone's going to be in the wrong place at the wrong time and get stung and, and take a life. Call it cultural conditioning or just good hygiene. But for most of us, there's nothing more repulsive than maggots. Their pallid color, their moist, pulpy bodies, their creepy, crawly ways. Maggots are the immature form of flies. But even at this tender age, they seem like an unhealthful nuisance. They live to eat, and their preferred diet is dead, rotting flesh. Maggot swarms are so voracious, they actually play an important role in the wild, helping to clear away the carcasses of dead animals. But they make other, much more surprising contributions as well. It's hard to imagine, but there are factories that actually raise maggots commercially. Why? Maggots are used in agriculture to feed chickens, and believe it or not, others are raised for medical purposes. Since ancient times, surgeons have used maggots to clean their patients' wounds and prevent infection. Because they only eat dead tissue, maggots are sewn into hard-to-reach lesions, where they do what comes naturally, eating away the dead flesh and leaving healthy tissue alone. Maggots may be good medicine, but most of us still find them hard to stomach. Rodents may be the most notorious of all swarming creatures. They're legendary for their ability to spread terror and disease. They've wreaked havoc on civilization since the dawn of time. In southeastern Australia, swarms of mice erupt every few years, destroying crops and grain supplies. This is what these people are living with, and this is what they're complaining about. They just want some sort of help. Reproducing in vast numbers, they consume everything in sight. When they struck in 1993, the mice caused close to $100 million in damage. If mice can be bad, rats are even worse. Throughout history, they've been responsible for devastating plagues, like the Black Death, which wiped out half of Europe in the 14th century. Even today, rats continue to be a problem in urban areas around the world. One of the worst things that you could call somebody in New York, I think James Cagney said, is a dirty rat. And I think that, you know, people see it that way. They don't want to be associated with it. They're stigmatized by it. And so therefore, rats really is a symbol of decay, deterioration, and not 
not living very well. A recent government study revealed that there's at least one rat for every human in New York City. That's 6.8 million rats. You have to visualize yourself. What would 6.8 million rats look like together? I, I can't imagine that, but certainly you have to use imagination to, to think about that. I feel rats uh, based on what they're able to do to survive. You know, they're almost like Superman, you know, they can fall off a three-story building and still survive. They can climb through a hole large enough just to, for their head. If their head can get through this hole, the entire body can. They can swim for hours. They can swim underwater. They can uh, climb buildings that are almost impossible for anyone else to do. And so therefore, they're able to survive. And certainly, I fear uh, them in terms of what they're able to do. Rodents and other swarms can be devastating. When animals swarm out of control, they are our worst nightmares and a terrifying reality.